Born to Kill, written by Tom McCall. Harkin wasn't really sure how to leave this training. There had been no changes to the kit of the Royal Guard in over 15 generations. The troops standing before her didn't even have straps for this particular device. Logistics had to rush in tailors at a tremendous cost, and for the time being, she was going to have to ask her troops to simply tie them to the weapons. Attention! As you may have heard, there have been reports of some unusual troops mixed in with the Klaxian forces. These reports, while exaggerated, are accurate. A new species called the uh, Terran have joined the Klaxian League, and per Article 14 of the Galactic Possession Conventions, the Klaxon are permitted to deploy one Terran per 2,500 troops. This is the maximum allowed due to their proportionally small population in the Klaxon Legion. Upon arrival to the designated battlefield, we can expect there to be four in total, as our Empire has agreed to 10,000 unit trial of conquest for the solar system. Although we have filed a formal objection to the Terran inclusion after the massacre at SDKG-48, the current trial of conquest cannot be postponed without forfeiting the system. Harkon didn't doubt the bravery of her troops. The Empire had gone to great lengths as to ensure the rumors of what happened at SDKG-48 hadn't been blown out of proportion. However, Harkon did not like the pale scales of her assembly. She had actually taken a moment prior to starting the presentation to brighten herself using powders from her ceremonial kit. This was not going to be an easy speech. As you may have heard, the Terrans do not utilize standard ablative armor or energy shields. We have obtained an example of what our analysts are calling heat-treated crystalline iron carbon. There is an additional layer of what appears to be uh, a biofiber. However, the primary component is this steel, as we know it is called by the Terran forces. Harkon felt a great deal of shame, skipping the natural calcium crystal internal frames, but as there was nothing to offer on that subject, she had been instructed to keep that private after her briefing. Soldier! She motioned to the most confident colored troop that she could see in front of her. Behind me is a torso component of the steel. She pointed at the curiously shaped plate mounted on a block of structural frame. She tried to ignore the implications of it being almost her own height. I want you to fire your pulse rifle into it. Maximum yield. A joyful color on the veteran scales and a sudden burst of attention from the troops. Pulse rifles were expensive and firing one in maximum was generally forbidden as it had an almost 40% failure rate. There was some serious debate about phasing out the ability that had been raging on for all of Harkin's career. The veteran crouched down and turned the setting past the safety clasp, then triggered with an audible ping. Under normal conditions, that by itself would have given a court-martial. Harkin gave the nod and the room went white. When the ringing stopped, Harkin noted that the rifle had indeed fused itself to its battery. She had to admit that it was the first time that she actually witnessed that function outside of a recording. She took a deep breath and looked at the armor, half hoping her last briefing had been a sick junk. There was a visible heat waves coming off the entire thing. It looked like the layer of color was gone, but in truth, the dull metallic shine looked even more defiant now. Approaching it, as some of her troops were doing without her permission, she could even see the engraved markings had not been altered. In an effort to regain order, she drew her officer's splint pistol, and then she pulled the trigger. A thin sliver of ferrous material was shaved off of an aluminium block, and sent slipping down the track at speed so high that the 0.05 grams of mass produced enough recoil to make her insides lurch. There was a puff of ferrous dust and a flash of light where the splinter had exploded on the armor. Her class of guards snapped to attention, some visibly ashamed to have broken ranks without permission. What you did not hear about SDKG-48 was that almost 90% of our troops attempted an overload after engaging the Terrans. Do not do that! There will only be four of them on the field and they cannot be harmed by either pulse or splint. Almost all of the casualties we suffered were from regular troop engagement after our troops had destroyed their own primary arms. Murmurs of disbelief went through the ranks. To think that over 90,000 troops risked an overload was unthinkable. 
Given the unusual circumstances, Command decided not to punish the survivors as they could not have known what you all were about to learn. The steel is manufactured in a 9.8 meters per second square gravity well and appears to involve other unique processes that we have not fully understood. If you are wondering when you are going to get your own set, she motioned to the technician to release the mount. The plate fell off the edge and buried itself almost in its own thickness into the deck sticking upright. Not until you can carry six times your own mass. Listen well, you are some of the finest troops in the Empire and I think you deserve to know the truth. A Terran troop is a biped 2.7 times your height and on average when kitted out weighs you by a factor of 18. If we are to believe that the same 9.8 meters per second squared manufacturing conditions is also their home world standard, then they will be fighting at less than a third of their own standard. Reports from SDKG48 suggest that this will allow them to jump over 25 meters, and they are fast. From what I've been told, they have absurdly powerful explosive kinetic weapons. Thanks to the size of these projectiles, they only carry 180 rounds. But they are very disciplined in how they spend them. After action surveys estimate that they scored at almost 30% on the shots, and if you're hoping your energy shield will stop their rounds, don't. We found that although it will stop the round, the force was still enough to rip your generator out of its housing and send the shield into you with enough force to shatter your exoskeleton. We are estimating that the Terran unit will kill 208 of you before they run out of ammunition. Thankfully, their size does not allow them to use their allies or your own weapons when that happens. Total silence from the room. Thanks to the generations of relative parity during the formal trial warfare, Casualties were always high. The troops accepted this truth. Still, to lose over 200 royal guards to four of these monsters, Harkin needed to continue before she faltered. If you do your job and do not overload your weapon, we estimate a 40% chance to win this system. Furthermore, the mandatory truce period after the battle will buy us much needed time to find a solution for future Claxian conflicts involving Terran troops. I cannot stress this enough. Do not shoot at the Terran troops, it'll only give away your position. And time spent shooting at them is precious time you're not shooting at the Claxian regulars. Statistically, these are the greater threats to our victory. Legat Harkin, the same veteran that had fired earlier, signaled the question. She couldn't help but notice that all the color that had attracted her initially was gone. Go ahead, she motioned. What happens when they run out of ammunition? Harkin tried not to pause. They'll attempt to, um, to, um, squish you. The device that you are being issued are magnetic proximity detectors. If a Terran tries to squish you, the device will activate, and it is our hope that the concussive blast will disable them. Harkin could see the images of the bodies from her briefing. She had decided an explanation would suffice rather than share those images. Besides, that's what her devices would prevent. It was a grim calculus, but that was her job. Lagat, I'm assuming 10,000 royal guards with suicide bombs. Tarkin gave the most sympathetic color she was able. No doubt her own false powder color covering betrayed by such an act. After a long career of sending her empire's finest to the ends, this crossed the line she never knew existed. What choice do we have, Trooper? Not a sound came from the assembled troops. There really was nothing else to say. They would do their duty. She knew that. And so did they. The Empire wills it, she shouted. And we obey, thundered back, although more muted than she remembered hearing in the past. She stayed behind to stare at the now cool plate stuck to her parade deck. The briefing she had received did manage to approximate the meaning of the engraved symbols. Burst to end life, or something close. If that wasn't disturbing enough, she was told that it was engraved by the creature that wore it only using a steel blade and with its own strength. Standing alone beside the massive plate, she could see herself in the now reflective surface. All her natural color drained by the powdered layer looked absent. A pathetic sight. How many of her comrades would see themselves like this as these monsters flew at them? End of chapter. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope 
that you enjoyed, and if you do, please consider supporting the author, even by popping over and leaving a thumbs up or a nice comment, just to show your appreciation for the story. However, if you wish to support this channel, there are links down below which will help immensely. I will see you all in the next one, and until then, I hope that you have a fantastic day. Cheers. Born to Kill, Chapter 2 Joining the other Laguts in the observation room, Harkins saw the other's somber gunners. Among her own rank, the pretense of confidence that she had kept up for her troops could be abandoned. She had removed her powdered colors after seeing her reflection in a sample of Terran armor recovered from SDKG-48. Under normal circumstances, there was no need for close inspection of the battle's situation. Trial combat rules did not permit any intervention or instruction from the forces outside orbit. All data would be meticulously logged for future analysis and to determine system royalties and battle salvage rights. Once the battle was over, her own empire and the Klaxian along with the neutral galactic third parties would examine the battlefield and negotiate the ratios of ownership for the solar system. All rather routine. However, the size and quantity of the observation teams from all three parties were comically disproportionate to the value of this system. Everyone assembled here wanted to see the four Terran troops that were joining the Klaxian regulars. This would be the second deployment of Terran troops in history and already they had caused an unprecedented and rapid alteration to the carefully balanced system her empire had been using for generations including proximity mines with all of her own legion units was, even in the event of victory, going to cause a huge economic penalty to at least of the system. She had personally had to justify her request to the Empire's legal team only days prior to entering the system. As a half-measure, they permitted only her own legion to equip them. Harkin was deeply worried this was a mistake, but had expanded all her military clout even to procure a thousand mines. An audible tone informed her that the other nine legats and pre-battle deployments were almost completed, and the total information would soon be available. Thanks to the shared transponder data, observers would have raised the sharp views of the battle. As instructed, the Empire had deployed nine legions in a bow-shaped line to engage the Klaxian. Harkin's own legion was behind the center of the bow and had been instructed to reinforce wherever the Terran forces appeared. If they repeated their actions of SDKG-48, they would charge through the line and cause total chaos behind the main engagement. Previously, this had caused panic and troopers had tried to down the Terrans using a dangerous overload of their pulse rifles. As a consequence, the Klaxian regulars were able to massacre the disarmed Empire troops. This would not happen again. All troops had been instructed to ignore the Terrans and allow Harkin's Legion to engage the Terran until they ran out of ammunition. Experience had taught them that they would then attempt what they called melee. Barbaric but brutally effective tactics that the Empire historians had to brief the military on after consulting records archived in the Galactic Library. It was after that history lesson Harkin came up with the proximity mines. The morality of it was repulsive, the technology crude, but it was the only solution anyone could come up with for such short notice. It was agreed this tactic would only ever be used until a more palatable countermeasure could be found. Another tone signaled total information was online. As expected, the Klaxian had deployed in a staggering line. Due to the bow shape, Empire forces were already at a disadvantage due to their shorter battle line. Both flank legions were prepared for this and had entrenched themselves in a limited pre-battle stage. None of this came as a surprise to anyone in the room, and immediately everyone accessed the Klaxon battle roster and filtered by species. Disaster. The Terrans were not together as they had done previously. They were seemingly randomly sprinkled across the line. Harkins and Turians would have to break her legion and engage in four locations. But without intel she had access to, they had no way to know this. Any hope of ground observers being able to identify the problem in time to organize a response was dashed when all four Terran units charged. Harkin had highlighted all four of them on her system map, 
She had seen data from SDKG-48, but the speed was no less shocking to her. Both Legion hadn't finished charging their rifles before the Terran was inside the meta border of the Legion. Unit lights were blinking out on every data bag it received. Hark opened up the optical probe views of the 4th Legion's grid, and a steady tick of photo showed the shadows of the Terrans blinking between the craters of the moon. Some bright points indicated the Legion troops had already begun overloading their rifles. Futile, but you couldn't blame them. Even from the comfort of orbit, she was starting to miss key data points trying to understand what was happening. A pause to collect herself and remember that she could do nothing to help her troops other than observe and prepare for future battles. She looked at the 2nd, 5th, and 7th legions grids to see the same situation unfolding in each. No doubt her own legion would soon advance on the 5th's grid, incorrectly assuming that it had all four of these avatars of death. More concerning, if that was even possible, was that the Klaxians were advancing almost unchallenged, as the legions tried to deal with the carnage amongst their entrenchments, there was no time to fend off the regulars. Over 4% of the 10,000 strong deployment were dead or dying. She had no way of knowing how many had destroyed their own rifles, but the optical map suggested hundreds, if not 1,000. The entrenched 1st and 9th were being totally bypassed as the Klaxons abandoned the formation to rush the center. An hour later, any semblance of order was gone. As Harkin predicted, her own 10th legion had rushed the 5th's right flank. In a cruel irony, the Terrans appeared to think that this was some sort of critical point in the battle rather than a trap. All four of them converged on the grid, literally shattering a path as they went. They had all apparently run out of ammunition in the first seven minutes of battle. The melee tactics caused even more panic amongst the Empire troops, and pulse rifle overloads could be seen unaided from orbit. The Terrans figured out the proximity mines after one unit set off three in a row while stomping on the Legionnaires. Each blast sent the unit a dozen meters in the air with brutal force. The biped could still be seen sitting upright after the last blast seemed to surpass its endurance. Another Terran had come to its aid and after some communication appeared to have discerned how to identify the mines. The three remaining Terrans simply stopped engaging 10th Legion units and started throwing other Legion units, or pieces of them, at them. The forces occasionally even set off the mines. There was no way to tell how many Terrans had killed. If pressed, Harkin would estimate four to six hundred over the course of the battle. In total, less than nine hundred had survived to the ceasefire. The Klaxians had again swarmed over the disorganized and disarmed troops. As a false multiplier, these Terrans were unprecedented. Harkin had actually tasked one of the optical sensors to look at the Terran habitat crudely attached to the Klaxian transport. These post-battle periods usually involved networking with peers, arms dealers, system trade delegates, and logistics corporations. Network traffic was simply bombarding the Terran habitat. An automatic system was directing all traffic to the appropriate Klaxian contact. These Terrans seemed to have no interest in the galactic trade or politics. In fact, after a shuttle had returned the four Terrans deployed, there had been no activity at all from the ugly box attached to the sleek hull of the modified Klaxian transport. No whispered question from the totally grey Legat interrupted her thoughts. So, what are you going to do, Legat? All nine of her peers had huddled around her after she had received a call from the ship's communications officer. The Terran battle barge, as her fleet had started calling the Cursed Tumor, had hailed the 10th Legion's deployment ship directly and requested to speak with its commander. After a flurry of objections and multiple demands that a more senior Empire personnel be selected, the voice of the Terran battle barge had made it abundantly clear that an invitation to Harkon, and only Harkon, was being extended. This was to not be an official diplomatic meeting and no recording device of any kind would be permitted. A Galaxian transport had been dispatched to ferry her over at her convenience. The Galaxian shuttle pilot had curiously informed her that she was to select from a menu. Apparently, she was being offered a choice of meal during her visit. If the list was given it was accurate, this Terran ship had a stock of some of the finest foods in her empire. They even claimed to have royal jelly. Harkin had never even been in the same room as Royal Jelly. I guess I'll try the jelly and Talvian nectar, Harkin answered. 
stunned. End of chapter. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed, and if you do, please consider supporting the author, even by popping over and leaving a thumbs up or a nice comment just to show your appreciation for the story. However, if you wish to support this channel, there are links down below which will help immensely. I will see you all in the next one, and until then, I hope that you have a fantastic day. Cheers. Born to Kill, Chapter 3 Again, the Terrans had caused a total collapse of order amongst the Empire, this time using nothing but an invitation. Meeting among combatants after a trial of conquest was not unusual. Harkin had personally met with the Claxians on multiple occasions, as their two species were very similar culturally, and often viewed one another as friends. The fact that they had clashed hundreds of times in the past was simply a matter of proximity and necessity. Both species were uniquely suited to ground combat, and were paid rather well to represent both their own and others' interests across the galaxy. Maintaining a standing military presence in the galaxy, either yourself or by paying another race to do it on your behalf, was a time-honored practice that ensured security on the galactic core. There was no true animosity amongst the war races past a healthy rivalry. But these Terran, these Terran hadn't utterly crushed them in the second time. Worse, they didn't even follow their own initial doctrine. Upon learning of the invitation to dine being offered to a lowly legat while refusing to even answer hails from the royal family, the entire fleet was in disarray. In an effort to represent dignity that they had resisted to urge to swarm Harkin's observation ship with shuttles, but the facilities on board were simply not equipped to perform the hundreds of tasks being asked. Besides, most of these tasks were conflicting to begin with. The Merchant's Guild had demanded she present the industry list to her hosts. The military was instructing her to wear full ceremonial dress despite her being tragically underranked for such an extravagance. She didn't even think that there was a platinum mandible cover in the solar system. She had less than an hour before the shuttle was to depart. Ultimately, it was decided that this was a personal invitation. Although she was being ordered to attend, she would have full discretion on what that meant. Maximum responsibility and minimal control. The story of any Lugat's career. Harkin decided to use that time to requisition a new uniform and some assistance in molting slightly ahead of schedule. There had been some serious debate about wearing her officer's splint pistol but Harkin had exercised the discretion offered to her and outright refused. Partially out of protocol, and also because the Terran ship was running at anything close to 9.8 meters per second squared gravity, this pistol would pin her to the ground the moment she stepped off the shuttle. Her ship did happen to have a grooming attendant on board, and a ranking officer on the ship insisted she be given a full pattern of colored powder. A quick shot of fermented nectar to calm her pheromones and Harkin was escorted to the waiting Claxian shuttle. Disappointingly, the shuttle was crewed by two Claxians, wasting the time of every ranking officer crowding the airlock. The co-pilot was polite enough and even assisted her in stepping onto the ship. After she was secured and they were underway, she attempted to speak with the pilot. So, have either of you actually met these Terrans? A brief delay under the ship to translate. No, Legat, they, they don't get out much. There are a few stewards on that habitat of theirs, but they don't like to talk about what goes on in there. Harkin tried to keep them going more than calmer self than any real purpose. What's with the configuration anyhow? It looks like it's just mounted to a 408 EST. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. They don't have extra solar transit, or at least they don't have enough to spare for these trials. Rumor has it that we tried to convert some ships for them, but the gravity systems just couldn't be pushed that hard without total refit. The pilot chimed in. That, and we would have to cut out every second deck for height, every third if we wanted them comfortable. Harkin was having some regrets about not taking a bit more of that nectar. Listen, we aren't going to be able to take you on board. We're going to wait for you at the docking collar. Take as much time as you need. The shuttle went into a tight little roll and knocked collars. Okay, we're here to make it real slow when you step on, and whatever you do, don't jump. If you have anything that you can take off, do it now. 
Harkin reluctantly took off her outer layer with all the pinned adornments. She really should have just worn training silk weave. She wasn't sure how the Terrans felt about excreted fibers, though. Stepping off the shuttle, she was relieved to find that the docking room was at a standard 3.4 meters per second squared. Her invitation had assured her that the climate would be able to sustain her without any danger, although the pressure would require a decompression cycle when she left. Waiting in the room was yet another Klaxian. Welcome, Lekat. I'm Stuart Tully. If you would follow me, I will take you to the specialist Chen's quarters. Specialist? Is this Chen a civilian? Harkin knew enough Klaxians to know that the posture meant total lack of further knowledge. They're all ranked as specialists. They all outrank us, but can't order us. They, uh, request things. Ask them to do something, and they will usually do it. Order them to do something, and they usually won't. Klaxian hierarchy was legendary amongst the galaxy. The statement alone had made Harkin's mind cloud, and would be picked apart for days after she was debriefed. The Klaxi extended a limb and transferred a remote while motioning to a platform over. You are welcome to transit the habitat under your own power, but I, uh, I request that you use a gravity pad during your visit. The gravity pad was worth more than a prime chamber on a home world. Harkin boarded the pad and watched Tully board her own. To the side of the chamber, there were four more parked. As she was directing her pad through the next airlock, the hall before her was at least five times her own height. She felt like she was entering the kingdom of a god. An excitement of the day's events had almost let her forget that over 90% of her own legion was dead. The materials of the hallway seemed to share that reflective properties of the monolithic armored plate that had so far been the closest she had been to terror. Even with her power to cover, a Klaxian would be able to tell that she was frightened. This was a kingdom of demons, birthed to end life. Those symbols may as well have been carved onto her optical pods. End of chapter. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed, and if you do, please consider supporting the author, even by popping over and leaving a thumbs up or a nice comment, just to show your appreciation for the story. However, if you wish to support this channel, there are links down below which will help immensely. I will see you all in the next one, and until then, I hope that you have a fantastic day. Cheers. Born to Kill, Chapter 4 How many Terrans are in this habitat, Tully? Harkin was sure there was more urgency in that question than she had intended. There was visible discomfort showing on Tully's faceplate. Harkin outranked the steward. Of this, she was certain. Even if the Galaxian was recently in a combat zone, her empire and their league were back to the same galactic military and moment of trial ended. She was culturally and legally obliged to answer her question. The Terrans do not wish to disclose that information. Currently, they are designated as private citizens and have decided that details like that are protected as merchant trade secrets. That answer had come fast enough that it clearly wasn't the first time that it had been used. Harkin could think about a dozen reasons that statement wouldn't hold up in a court hearing, but this poor Klaxian looked like it wanted to roll into a ball. Harkin had to at least make an effort to learn something here. Her debriefing was going to be painful if she didn't come back with something other than a full digestive tract. I understand, but that means the ship isn't registered as military. So, what is it registered as? Both Tully and her own gravity pad hold it in the middle of the massive corridor. Are you a lawyer, Lagat? Harkin swore that the question sounded hopeful. No, but I am a trial procession, Lagat. Law is a big part of my job. Tali looked disappointed. Well, these Terrans are, I think they all are, even the hatchlings, especially the hatchlings. This isn't a ship, and it has removable docking clamps and no means of self-propulsion. It's a cargo container, and its contents are protected by the Merchant Trade Secrets subsection. Also, because they permanently attached a medical archive to the exterior of the hull, it's a private medical record, like the entire... Not a ship. 
Tali resumed the platform's journey and seemingly telepathically answered Harkon's half-formed question before she had finished forming it in her mind. You can't ask why they bolted a medical archive to a cargo container's exterior. That's covered by the Cultural Landmark Office and must be answered by one of their officers. Between you and me, I don't think they have any Cultural Landmark Officers. Stopping again, Tali motioned to the door in front of them. This isn't an elevator. It's a mechanical medical filling tube that will take you to Specialist Chen's deck. Your platform will take you to her quarters automatically. Please do not attempt to step off your platform without considering the gravity. Good luck, Lagat. Don't let the hatchling grab you. What hatchling? The door closed before she had a chance to finish. What was clearly an elevator seemed to know where it was going, but Harkin didn't have a chance to let her optical translator have a look at the deck labels. She had come from the docking and storage deck. There appeared to be a deployment staging deck below her, but everything else looked to be civilian. Literary storage and educational deck, recreational outdoor simulation deck, the aquatic deck, and several decks she assumed were the quarters. Before she had a chance to figure out why there was no bridge, the door opened and her platform pressed on. Evidently, Chen's quarters were near the end of this, uh, whatever the structure was. Passing several doors, Harkin could see that they were labeled in similar markings as the engravings that she had seen days earlier. When the platform reached the door, an audible ping came from inside. A muffled noise passed through the door and Harkin's own body. Her translator had been updated during the shuttle ride, but it seemed to be thinking rather hard. Enter, dual meaning, dual recipients, clarity error. Before Harkin could figure out what to do, the door opened and all hopes of a dignified introduction were abandoned. The Terran, approximately her own height, was charging her and screaming a war cry that let her own sensory organs see her internal structures from the outside in. The Terran would be on top of her before she could jump off the platform, even assuming that the fall didn't kill her. The Terran obviously would. By some miracle, the Terran stumbled and started to fall, making almost no attempt to protect itself and maintaining eye contact as it went down. At speeds impossible to her own species but slow enough to comprehend, another creature materialized next to the charging monster. At least three times the side of the homicidal demon, it caught it mid-air and lifted it into its own frame. Tones of pure bass felt more than heard, washed through her as she had to position her body to find the top of the giant that had saved her life. Hello, Harkin. Um, sorry about that. Uh, this is Lucas. Say hello, Lucas. The creature that had tried to get her motioned with its upper limb. Hello, hello, hello. Repetition, Repetition error. Speech is infantile. A hatchling. A decorated legat of the Empire had considered leaping onto the gravity deck that would have turned her insides into liquid, just to avoid the charge of a hatchling. With no idea what her color was at this moment, Harkin straightened her thorax and presented herself. No apologies needed, Specialist Chen. I am Legat Harkin. Greetings, Hatchling Lucas. The hatchling continued its rapid waving gesture with the same limb that had threatened to rip her off a platform a moment ago. Eyes were still locked on her despite Chen's gyrating bounce. Oh, I'm her husband, Rene. She's in the kitchen trying to figure out your jetty. Again, the bass filled the room as Rene doubled his initial volume. She's here, babe. Just a moment. Harkin, make yourself comfortable. I'm going to give this guy uh, a hibernation ritual before dinner. Harkin didn't have the time to answer before the giant seemed to comfortably glide away, carrying a hatchling that might have been three times her own weight. It was deeply unsettling how its head seemed to have locked onto her location without effort, adjusting to the carrier's rapid movements. Using a lull and activity, Harkin absorbed the implications of what had just happened. There were at least two drone males in this dwelling. Specialist Chen must have been some sort of broodmother. She had been given access to his broodmother's private chamber. This had not happened since she was an egg. The hatchling's murder charge must have been instinctive. Who knew how many other hatchlings might have been in the walls of this chamber? It was impressive that the adult drone had the sentient control to not only save her life and exchange greetings, 
but resist the instinct to kill her where she stood. This entire structure was a hive. They had brought a hive into orbit and transported it to a conflict zone. The hatchling showed her that they truly were birthed to end life, but it seemed that they grew into something more restrained. End of chapter. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. There are links down below both to support this channel and for the author of this fiction. Anyways, I hope you all have a fantastic one, and I'll see you next time. Cheers. Born to Kill, number five. Soon, the Terran broodmother would return from her feeding chamber, and Harkin would be face to face with not just a Terran, but a queen of the sign. There were stories from long before her species had left orbit, of an ancient battle fought in the very heart of a hive. To stand in another hive's birthing chamber was to dream of any grub selected for military service. This Terran had invited her in without so much as a security scan. Of course, Harkon wouldn't dream of trying to harm her, as that had been outlawed by both her own species and every civilized race eons ago. No. Harkin must be mistaken. This couldn't be a queen. Maybe one of her fertile daughters sent to command this campaign. Still, an unfathomable honor, but not utter madness. Harkin herself was the spawn of a minor daughter. Her mother would have never permitted an audience with anyone but her own mother. Any foolish dreams of carrying a brood mother's head back to her own hive, like the stories that she was raised with, were gone the moment Specialist Chen came striding out the kitchen. Curiously, it was slightly smaller than the male drone that had stopped the hatchling moments ago. The creature was still three times her size, but seemed slender. Stranger still, she was walking under her own legs with no chamber drones assisting her. She must be incredibly young given her size compared to the hatchling. What was that smell? The broodmother was carrying something that made Harkin's mandibles ache. She had to start swallowing drool before it shot out of her mouth. Harkin, I'm so glad you came. Again, the bass filled the air. Harkin couldn't tell if Chen was sprinting, but the speed she was approaching her platform was shocking. Queen Broodmother Chen of the Terran, congratulations on your victory. May your brood grow across the stars. Harkin assumed her message, and her own head would be sufficient tribute to conclude whatever bizarre surrender ceremony was underway here. Chen abruptly stopped and tapped what looked like a translator on her waist against her own chin, an awkward maneuver as her upper limbs were carrying some sort of tray. In an awkward silence, Harkin became aware that she had in fact drooled on herself. Worse, the brood mother was turning red, almost universally a bad sign across the races, Harkin, can you hear me? I think our translators are mismatched. That was, uh, very formal. This needed to be saved immediately. Insulting another racist broodmother was grounds for war, and Harkin did not envision it would end well for her empire. Yes, broodmother Chen, the fault is certainly with me. Harkin, can we forgo the formalities? My name is Wombei Chen, Bei for short. Can I adjust your platform for you? Can't imagine that you're very comfortable. Before Harkin could answer, Bay had, with grace and speed, shifted herself onto one of her only two legs and used the free one to tap a button underneath Harkin's platform. She did all of this without putting down the tray of whatever treasure she was making that smell. With a gentle push, the platform ascended two times her own height and she was head to head with Bay, who was without a doubt a shade of red that she should not have been when exiting the kitchen chamber. To her shame, Harkin winced in preparation for the death blow. Only then could she see the contents of the tray. Sealed in silk, composite, and marked with the stamp of her empire was an entire cell of royal Jenny. Queen, broodmother, is that for me? Harkin had retracted her second eyelid to get a better look at it. Although the pressure of the ship was painful, she was in no hurry to close them. Only if you start calling me Bay. Pulsating bass, mirth, laughter. <laughs> Just Bay. Her volume briefly stunned Harkin's pressure senses, but it seemed to have been a friendly gesture. 
And you need to tell me how to open this. Um, the package is uh, so pretty. I, I don't want to do it wrong. They couldn't get me a Talvian nectar that you asked so, so I asked the steward for the next best thing. Bottles are on the table, so is what I think is an opener. Help yourself and me. <laughs> First contact and you asked for the hard stuff. I like your style, Harkin. I told the shuttle crew not to wait up. Bay revealed a wide set of white crushing organs hidden behind her mouth. To her horror, Bay almost threw down the jetty onto the table when a piercing alarm came from the feeding chamber. Tapped Harkin's platform, causing it to drift towards the table, and ran back to the room that she'd come from. That was real running. Whatever speed had been prior was not. That was the speed that put the Terran in full battle armor into the Legion's perimeter before a shot was fired. It's all good, I can fix this, uh, open the bottles. Harkin didn't want the bottles. She didn't want anything but the jenny that was so cruelly just out of her reach. Maybe an explanation as to what the hell was going on, but mostly the jenny. 9.8 meters per second squared, only a meter at most. She can make it, she told herself. End of chapter. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. There are links down below, both to support this channel and for the author of this fiction. Anyways, I hope you all have a fantastic one, and I'll see you next time. Cheers. Born to Kill, Chapter 6 Standing at the edge of the platform, Harkin reached over the side to test her reach. There was a tingle on the border of the gravity bubble. She felt the intense sensation of weight as her limb continued to reach forward. Even if she could extend all the way, she wasn't even close to reaching. She would have to jump and try to land on the table without breaking her exoskeleton. A blur of pale flesh snapped her out of her madness. The hatchling was back, stripped of its previous garments and wet. It had no shame. Only this time, the homicidal stare was on her cell of jelly. Panic set in as she realized there was no way the hatchling could reach across the table. Mercifully, her own platform was also well out of its kill range. Unless it could jump. Could it jump? Deity's miracle conception reanimated male hatchling! Lucas, at least let me get you dropping sack. Sorry, again Harkon, he's almost done. Say goodnight, Lucas. The drone's voice came flowing through the chamber that he had retreated to earlier. The hatchling walked away on its own, but this time waved its upper limb at the jelly. Eyes never losing luck till it left the chamber. Coming to her senses, Harkin managed to use the remote given to her by the steward to maneuver the platform to face the hatchling chamber. The platform wouldn't allow her over to the table, but it would get her in reach of the bottles that she'd been ordered to open. The opener might have given her a chance if the hatchling came back. The nectar on the table wasn't from a planet that she was familiar with, but the bottles looked expensive. The level of fermentation on the number of the bottles were enough to kill so several times over. She would need to pace herself without insulting her host. She managed to open two before Bay came gliding back again with a tray. <laughs> um, I hope you like it well done. <laughs> Laughter. Shame. Normally, masked by her translator, these Terran voices were distracting, able to be felt through the translations. Some sort of burnt protein with vegetation, Harkin discerned visually. You can safely eat this domestic, mostly blightless flying creature. I checked with the stewards and the database. Apparently, Bay was able to read facial cues because she immediately detected the confusion. Sorry, um, try this. Bay placed a small device on the table and turned it to face Harkin. An optical projector flashed a brief feedback as her own translator was bypassed. Harkin's military-issued translator cracked as if it belonged to the Terran. The optical translation portion of a view displayed a new interface. Introduction screen, loading, Cilandro Tutor, license restricted use. The Cilandro were one of the oldest races in the galaxy. Their biology made it impossible to leave their single planet without enormous expense. They were some of the finest software engineers amongst the thousands of races. The Cilandro Tutor AI was a treasure afforded only to the wealthiest, using one as a simple translator with a display of wealth and power intended to inspire awe. It worked. 
Bay now had two items on her table that showed Harkin she was every bit a broodmother. Chicken, Bay repeated. This time the word was clear. Harkin could see the chicken and hear its noises. She could somehow even smell it. Amazed, she looked back at Bay. Now her own face was clear. The red was an embarrassment. The mouth parting was friendship. Her eyes cared about Harkin's opinion on the chicken. I would love to try your burnt chicken, Bay, but uh, can I first have that jetty? I just about jumped off my platform while you were gone. <laughs> Promise to not call me Queen Broodmother again. Harkins expressed her joy in her own way and the laughter grew louder. Now she could feel and understand it. This was going to be the most interesting meal Harkin had ever had. Cheers. The bottle. She wanted to drink the bottle, but after banging them together, Harkin took the bottle and let Bay tap hers on her own. Bay's hand was so large only two fingers held on the bottle while Harkin struggled to hold hers outside the gravity boundary. The speed and grace that had seemed so unnerving moments ago was this time employed by Bay to catch Harkin's bottle, with a surprising tenderness guided her back to the safety of her platform. Terrence are warm, Harkin blurted out. Again, Bay blushed. Harkin inexplicably knew both the word meaning and the cause. There are many things you don't know about us. That's why I invited you over. This galaxy is so strange to us. We were trying our best to adapt. But your suicide devices, Harkin. Bay was sad. Harkin now knew that this and the feeling was too much. I and uh, so many others knew that this would happen. This idea of civilized war to end wars... It works for so long. You can't imagine how, but it's working. Terrans are going to change things in ways none of you are prepared for. I've tried to talk to the Galaxians, but they don't understand. Harkin changed her color to match her shame. The Mines. This was about the Mines. End of chapter. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed there are links down below both to support this channel and for the author of this fiction. Anyways, I hope you all have a fantastic one, and I'll see you next time. Cheers. Born to Kill, Chapter 7 May went quiet and emptied her tiny bottle. Harkin took a moment and a long pull of her own. The Sayai tutor was flooding her with the nuance of what Bay had just said. Bay wasn't angry. She was sad, not for herself, but for Harkin. Something primal gave her out of Harkin. She didn't need this brood mother's pity. The devices didn't fail, they simply hadn't used enough of them. If her empire had listened to her and equipped all ten legions, things would have been different. Her sisters might not have won the field, but they would have been closer. Their contract would have been awarded far more of the system's economic output to their employers. This loss would cost her own hive deeply. Billions of tons of protein would be diverted to more successful broods. A generation of larvae would have to hibernate for lack of resources. Another loss like this and those same larvae might have to feed the grubs. You're right, we were not prepared, but next time we will be. I killed one of your soldiers this time, and next time we will be even stronger. My brood won't be driven underground just so yours can travel the stars. Crack! The sound shook her entire drawer like an explosion. Something Harkin hadn't done in her entire life had just happened. She had snapped her mandibles together in a show of dominance. That was an action only used to inform the nursing cast that a princess was demanding obedience. It was rage, fermented nectar, and the smell of that jenny. It may have been the stupidest action in her life. She had just challenged a mature queen for control of her hive. Bay didn't even flinch. Patel... The translator fed Harkin a name, a Terran picture, and age. He isn't dead. Very injured, but not dead. I'm going to be working with him a lot. Did you know that he was the one that figured out the mines? Bad luck, really. Of the 44 draftees on board, he just happened to be from a region in the South Pacific that had seen a lot of those recently. First one in his entire country to leave orbit Traveled a thousand light years, all to be blown up with some H3 mining lease agreement. Bay opened another bottle without using the opener, just snapping it like a protein ration. 
Without looking at Harkin, she did the same for the royal jelly and placed it in Harkin's tray. I read your empire's last combat submission. They are doubling the yield and proposing to equip all Terran Klaxian hybrid engaged legions with them. Not just the 10,000 or 100,000 sized trials either. All of them. That's how it starts. Now Bay turned to look at her, eyes wet. The AI slapped Harkin with sorrow. Bay pulled up a hologram of a Terran unit clad in armor and holding those cannons that they had used. 18,232 battle points. Then an image of a mine came up at 1,209 points. Harkin was shocked to see that the mine was obviously a double yield. These Terrans had better intel on her own military than she did. 1,209. Do you know why Patel was carrying 180 rounds of ammunition? Harkin could see where this was going. The points limit on the contract. We just gave you a 7% budget boost. You are going to spend it on ammunition. Who knows what the Klaxian will spend it on. 6.74% flashed in a visor. That the AI tutor apparently lacking some tact, Harkin was clawing deep in her jelly but could hardly take her eyes off the projection. Secondary shields for the Klaxians. You are going to have to boost your pulse gun rate of fire and yield. That's going to cost you another thousand points at least. Good guess on the ammunition, but the only reason we were using caseless ammo was to fit the armor budget. That 7% will let us use a variation of your own splinter shaving system. Basically, limitless ammo. Escalation, Arkan. We show up, and in less than four years, we have caused a galaxy-wide escalation. How long is everyone going to play by these perfect rules if we keep this up? This was all too much, and the tutor interface combined with the jetty was making her head spin. Bay had just revealed her hive stratagem to a war race legat and cast doubt on Eon's worth of stability in a single speech. Click! It wasn't voluntarily. The emotion of realization was just too much. She needed a break. A scream came from the chamber the hatchling had retreated to earlier. Harkin briefly assumed that it was going to come and answer the challenge that she had issued to his mother, but the tutor told her that it was a distress call. Bay stood up. We probably woke him up. I know this is a lot to dump on you. Want to take a breather and help me put him down? Asking a stranger to tend to your young for you after a stranger just threatened to end your hive should have been a humiliating to an extreme, but Harkin couldn't say no to this creature. The AI showed how tired her face was, even a brief lesson on the dark sacks under her eyes. Harkin indicated agreement and directed her platform to follow Bay deeper into the hive. End of chapter. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. There are links down below both to support this channel and for the author of this fiction. Anyways, I hope you all have a fantastic one, and I'll see you next time. Cheers. Born to Kill, number 8 Not knowing what she expected, but sure that it wasn't this, Arkin took the time to study the heights in a sanctum. Her evolutionary quirk still let her mentally map the interior in great detail. This entire structure was basically just a rectangle with a few compartmental chambers. The main room and the kitchen with what appeared to be three more chambers down this tunnel. She could hear the hatchling in one and smell water in the other. The further chamber was much larger, assuming that this was a rectangle. Following Bay into the hatchling storage chamber, she saw the male drone had collapsed on the floor, Likely, he had finished his mating cycle and was in his death stage. Perhaps the hatchling would consume him later. Harkin was sad that he hadn't stayed with her longer when they had met. She hadn't even had a chance to thank him for saving her life. Oh, don't mind him. He can sleep through anything. He had a rough day. He is the primary surgeon on board. Spent all day going over the techniques that he is going to need for Patel after his swelling is under control. They captured the hatchling who was pacing in his cage. This little guy, on the other hand, likes to wake up for a song or two. Harkin couldn't say how long she stayed in the chamber. She had apparently finished all the jelly while watching Bay vibrate the hatchling with her speech organs. The song had helped Harkin through her intense reaction to the jelly. The smell had been overpowering, but actually eating it was making her dizzy. Thankfully, the hatchling hardly seemed aware of the intruder in its chamber. Let's go. Bay mouthed without a sound, and the tutor indicated her meaning. 
Harkin's head was swimming, but she managed to guide her platform out of the room without disturbing the drone or the hatchling. Back at the table, in abbreviation allowed for candor, Harkin simply asked Bay what she was, and the tutor somehow made the question coherent to her host. Bay seemed to know where to start and wiped the drool off her shoulder and began, Well, um, first of all, I'm no queen, brood mother, or whatever it is your translator keeps saying. Brood of three, just Lucas, Rene, and myself. We're a part of a support staff for the draftees. Rene is a doctor, so am I, Bay laughed. I have two doctorates, one in trauma physiology and another in neuroscience, and I don't think anyone has called me doctor since we left Seoul. They call me Shrink. I was part of the team that developed the Enhanced Emotional Combat Therapy device, and my job here is to help draftees cope with combat-related trauma and to develop new techniques for future draftees. The tutor was making a heroic effort to make this clear to Harkin, but it had its limits. Harkin now knew in vague terms that Bay was able to produce offspring, but only in a very limited fashion, and that her mate wasn't a half-genome drone, but a very talented healer. Bay was an extremely specialized healer, but of the mind, and was sent you to learn new healing techniques. So, your troops are not troops? Harkin was now very puzzled. Yes and no, it's complicated. Bay this time snapped two bottles open with one hand and offered one to Harkin. When she declined, Bay finished them both in rapid succession before continuing. We had to have enough eligible troops for the Galaxian to be able to justify including us into the Galactic War organization. I understand your empire uses less than 2% of you as military personnel, and from that 2%, the random selection only takes something like a quarter. Well, we needed to include 73% of our entire globe just to make the eligibility cutoff. Every man, woman, and, depending on your standards, child over the age of 17... There was some pushback from certain pacifist religions and more patriarchy-centered cultures about the inclusion of some groups, but we were in no state to turn down the aid the Klaxian had to offer. No loopholes this time, in theory. A world leader's 17-year-old daughter might die on the moon, and there's a 70-year-old father might die with her. One single draft irregularity could compromise our species' eligibility for official participation in galactic trials. You said your brood wouldn't go back underground, Harkin. Well, mine already was when the Galaxian found us. Our ecosystem was in ruins. India and China had just finished a thermonuclear war over the Himalayan water table. Turns out that you don't need fresh water when the people that needed it are turned to ash. No one needed salt water. We had plenty of that drowning the coasts that were home to half of the remaining population. There wasn't a drop of oil left in a reasonable access areas... We were using fusion plants to cool down entire cities, just to keep going. Another two bottles went down. They didn't offer one this time. Harkin wasn't a scientist, but the idea of trying to cool your crust using nuclear fire. Harkin was sure that a tutor had made a mistake about the atmospheric thermal weapons being deployed. So we cut a deal. A global draft of 73% of 9 billion people just to squeak past the regulations and enable us to participate in your tidy little games. Of the eligible draft, only 4 million would actually get the call. To us, 4 million was a rounding error during a dust famine. We killed off 10 times that just to consolidate consensus to take the Klaxian offer. It's not their fault, Harkin. They had nothing else to trade. Our entire solar system is a worthless backwater. That's why we took so long for anyone to find us. Bay looked at her chicken in disgust and then tore a chunk off of it and ate it barehanded. This chicken probably had to be cloned after a fusion power came online. We used to eat algae, chickens, for soldiers. We have done worse for less, I suppose. Lucas will grow up with chicken to eat. That's worth a lot to me. Harkin found a little unnerving to hear the crunching of black carbon. Once they saw what we could do for them, they gave us everything. Fusion power, atmospheric cleaners, and food aid. Hell, we would have done it just for the clean water. We sold what was left of our souls, and the worst part was we got a better deal than we deserved. Bay seemed like she had been talking more to herself than to Harkin until her bloodshot eyes locked onto Harkin. You want to see what you're up against? What I build? I can show you. I'm not supposed to, but I can do it. 
May's speech was getting slurred and the tutor was having a hard time now. Even drunk, she was so fast Harkin didn't have time to stop her as she activated the tutor. Harkin's visual input expanded to her entire vision. She was blind. She could still hear Bay, but she sounded so far away. Enhanced emotional combat therapy. <sighs> sounded better when I wrote it. Let me show you while we are selling. What the Klaxians bought. Buyers be rare, right? No refunds. <laughs> Crying laughter. What a joke. End of chapter. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. There are links down below, both to support this channel and for the author of this fiction. Anyways, I hope you all have a fantastic one, and I'll see you next time. Cheers. Born to Kill, Chapter 9 Harkin was now staring at an assembly of Klaxian warriors blanketed in a dust storm kicked up from the departing dropship thrusters. She saw almost the entire dropship scattered along the forming front line. She could actually feel the pings of the tiny rocks hitting the back of her helmet and hear the tapping sound as they bounced off. She must have been almost two meters tall to be able to see all these Klaxian. The closest ones couldn't bend their heads far enough to meet her gaze. Some sort of communication device drowned out the dust storm. Anyone else getting nervous when they stare at us like this? Laughter. A female voice cut in. Look at you three, the most eligible bachelors on whatever the feck rock with 20,000 lonely ladies. Wave at all the pretty girls, Patel. The tutor was still augmenting the simulation. Moldy was an Australian. Patel loved her like an older sibling. Harkin was getting sucked into the bottomless pit of tutors' attempts to explain questions as they formed. 20,000? I thought you said not if I was the last man on Earth, Specialist Moldy. How about a moon? More laughter. This time, three voices and Harkin's avatar in unison. Harkin figured it out. She was Patel. She could experience everything that she had in some sort of recording. She tried to tell Bay and found that she couldn't even feel her own mandibles. Only what must have been at least 30 rock-like crushes. Terrans were not warm. They were burning from the inside. She could feel the heat pushing back against the cold of her armor. His internal frame was driving the crushing weight of himself and his armor into the hardened dust below. She could actually feel the compacted dust cracking with each step while the clack scene seemed to be dancing on the surface. A much older voice came in. It was their patriarch. A 64-year-old grandfather they called Gramps. Harkin now understood that they had no drones. This male, who Patel trusted implicitly, was a father of a father. If such a thing existed in the Empire, he would look like a queen of another queen. Harkin felt the responsibility Patel had for him. Age had slowed him and he shouldn't have been here. Patel would see that nothing harmed him. Okay, kiddos, back to work. Split it up as we talked about. When we get to the green light, get in range and wiggle the bachelor asses for the ladies. You too, Moldy, we don't judge here. We want them shooting at us and not our little friends here. I'll give you a shiny star for each overload that you can bait out of them. Take your shots, nice and slow, but bring the ruckus. Wu-Tang clan ain't nothing to feck with. The tutor didn't attempt whatever that was. Laughter from the four of them again, and all of a sudden Harkin was moving literally flying across the field. Most of Patel's energy was being spent trying to not crash into the Klaxian, who offered a feeding gesture to Patel as he flew past them. They had timed that maneuver perfectly, and the battle had started right when Patel got to the outermost edge of his grid. Small wonder Harkin's legion spotter hadn't adapted in time. The Terrans had given them none. When Patel's HUD lit up, she could see that he had a full view of every legionary in front of him. He didn't take cover as there was nothing on this moon that could shield his massive silhouette. Lights burst along the lines as he took a volley of fire. Most missed as he was charging them in an angled jump. The few that landed merely disappeared into the steel plates. The Legat riding along inside his mind knew that all of these streaks of light should have been hitting the advancing Klaxian. This single action alone was upsetting the carefully choreographed dance perfected in her empire's war rooms. Her legion had lost. It just didn't know it yet. 
Medair, he lined up a shot with his HUD, apparently linked to the sights of his weapon, and Harkin felt the recoil at his bones. This simulation was too fast for Harkin, but she knew whatever he had been aiming at was gone. She had seen what a failed energy shield did to a legionary that had trusted it. Any notion that Patel was just a simple distraction disappeared along with the poor sister. Falling from an almost 16 meter apex, Patel was actually frustrated with the time it was taking to come down. Harkin could now understand that all these Terrans seemed to have frightening reflexes. They were accustomed to falling to a ludicrous gravity of their own nuclear hell of a world. Everything that came next was just a blur of movement and gore, with the occasional flash of an overloading pulse rifle. Harkin was mentally begging him to not load another magazine, and had to watch through his eyes each time. Another thirty explosions tore through her sister's Seven minutes it had taken Patel to fire his weapon to depletion. He had been calm in his aim and indifferent to the returning fire. If anything, he seemed to revel in it and chose to focus his fire on the legionary that had a good sense to fire at the Klaxians Patel had been deliberately covering. A steady stream of communication then came in as all four of his unit reported that they were empty. Gramps spoke up and they all formed around craters to kneel. Okay, kiddos, I'm all out of stickers for you. I think we did our job for today. Keep up with the front, but don't extend. I know what happened with those SDKG-48 clowns, but we don't do that here. Got it. Got it. Patel, something weird is going on in your grid. It looks like they've held the Legion in reserve and are trying to reestablish that bow shape that they started with. I want you to move back a couple of hundred meters till we figure out what's going on here. Patel jumped straight up like a coiled spring and took a full look at the situation from twenty meters above the battle. Harkin could see her own tenth legion charging. Gramps, sir, uh, my little lady friends are not going to be able to fall back in time. That wasn't a request, Patel. Move that tushy back. They know how to handle themselves. Patel looked below himself as he came down and saw at least a dozen Klaxian in his own crater trying to hold the room. He jumped far too high and it was taking precious time to come back down. Worse, vast near-vacuum winds combined with the moon's rotation were causing him to drift in his launching point. A legionary must have gotten into the flank at some point and was lining up his rifle, totally oblivious to Patel's coming down like a comet. Some cruel fate had caused Patel's shadow to alert her sister, who had only enough time to look up. Harkin wanted to scream for the legionary to run, but it was far too late. She felt Patel's fist drive the legionary into the ground, then through the dust layer, and finally his armored hand went through both sides of her exoskeleton. She would have died instantly. That was the only mercy now. Patel hadn't done anything like that in his short life. She felt his disgust with himself as his arm shot back into his side. To his horror, the limp body came firmly attached to his elbow. In a panic to free himself, he used his other forearm to shear the corpse off. The Klaxian beside him had turned around to see what impact had shaken the crater and totally froze in the shadow of this brutality. Patel screamed at the Klaxian to run, but he wasn't in the same channel and the near vacuum wouldn't have carried even that sense-shattering roar. Harkin thought the hatchling had been loud, but this was different. Light blackened Patel's vision as another legionary came over the ridge and overloaded a shot straight into the side of Patel's knee. His awkward crouch had put his plating apart, and the shot slipped through into and under his armor. Patel's world went white, and then Harkin felt his pain. Her own limbs grew back, and there was a limit to how much pain was useful to her. Once that limit had been reached, there was no need to go on. Her body was merciful, while Patel's was not. Anger, fear, rage, and pain. She had felt Patel's mind, and now she felt it banish. There was no more Patel. The legionary that had fired on him was now floating backwards with Patel's empty weapon lodged in its thorax. Several more legionaries came over the room and, shocked by the sight of Patel next to their desecrated sister, began to fire on him. Harkin didn't know where the front line was because neither did Patel. The HUD may as well have been off because he seemed to look through it in an effort to fixate on his attackers. Harkin may not have been able to close her first eyelids, but her mind seemed to shelter her from the worst of what she was seeing. 
Legionnaire's face frozen in horror as Patel launched himself at him, sometimes using one to bludgeon another. When Patel finally threw himself on the tenth legionary, he didn't seem to understand what had happened. The blast had knocked him far higher than he had been jumping to this point. He came down hard this time. His knee might have been broken, but the frame of his armor kept him upright. Patel and Harkin were now deaf, and their vision was now reduced to a tunnel searching for his tormentors. He took another two blasts before he gave up and simply sat down. Moldy arrived first to Patel's clouding eyes. She seemed like some sort of Valkyrie hurtling down between the rays of an unnamed star. She had to drive her foot through to the ground just to slow her body down when she landed. Patel, what the feck? What the feck? Patel's down. Patel! Patel, what the feck? Gramps! Patel couldn't hear her, but the recording seemed to overlay the communication channel onto the recording for Harkin. Harkin felt Patel's mind finally creep over the pain. He looked into Moldy's face and smiled. I'm okay, it's just, um, the little witches with the boxes on their hips don't touch them, okay? Harkin was all of a sudden aware that at some point Patel had bitten a piece of his own tongue off. It was hard to believe Moldy could have made out what he said. Moldy's face went blank. The tutor simply told Harkin that she was in null, emotional state. Through Patel's fading vision, she watched Moldy pick up a Claxian from behind and rip it in half. She then threw one half at a charging legionary and it vanished. Patel and Harkin both faded out, and Harkin's vision came back to see Bay passed out of the table. End of chapter. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. There are links down below both to support this channel and for the author of this fiction. Anyways, I hope you all have a fantastic one, and I'll see you next time. Cheers. Born to Kill Final Argon couldn't physically sweat, cry, or vomit, but the aftershock of what she had experienced had her mind screaming to do all three. Instead, she settled for sliding off of her platform and letting the crushing gravity wash over her. These Terrans lived with this pain every day of their tortured lives. She could still see the female Terran's face before it turned its back on Patel. For the first time tonight, Harkin was certain that she knew more than the tutor's now state description. That wasn't what that was. That was the last face the Trinian beings were going to see if she didn't stop this madness. Harkin needed time, and she needed space. She crawled back to her platform and guided it away from Dr. Wombei Chen, who now seemed so small. A tiny queen with a tiny brew from a tiny population of creatures who called a single dying planet their home. The Terrans that didn't grant her the title of Doctor were fools, but she was the wisest of them all. The Galaxian had their own troubles and had put all their hopes on the creatures who had no right to call themselves a war race. It wasn't their fault. They couldn't have known what they had traded for or what they had asked. Each single Terran had far too much at stake to be used as trial combatants. All the war races in the galaxy were hive species born ready to die for the brood as long as the queen prospered. These Terrans were born to curl to ensure everything they loved lived. Harkin's entire life had been for war, but she now understood that the galaxy only knew it as a game. These Terrans had to be saved from themselves, or the galaxy was going to burn along with them. Harkin went back to the hatchling's chamber and saw it sleeping just like its father. Harkin now understood that the fate of the entire brood was in that one hatchling. They had taken her here to save her empire's legions from certain death. Harkin was going to repay her if she had to march her own brood into the empire's queen of queens' hive. She left the room and took the tutor off the table with the still sleeping bay. She covered her with a piece of textile that she had found that the tutor had shown her was appropriate. She then downloaded Bay's entire library, including footage, history, songs, and movies. The tutor had no trouble performing its tasks. Harkin felt guilty for taking it, but she was going to need it for a mission. Slightly less noble, perhaps, but for reasons she didn't understand, she decided to enter the feeding chamber and take two remaining cells of Royal Jenny. 
By the time she had returned to her shuttle bay, the tutor had summoned her shuttle using Bay's authority, and the tutor's total disregard for authorization protocols. The steward Tali didn't dare stop the legat who had audacity to click her mandibles like a young princess. Epilogue Less than four years after the discovery by the Calaxians League, the Terrans had managed to join and then be removed as a war race designated species by the Galactic Council. In principle, the resource allocation system had been designed to ensure the Galactic Assembly compensated the war races to maintain their readiness and to stop them from ever truly instigating full-scale conflict. That purpose had been wise when it was written eons ago, but it could not have predicted the Terrans. In recognition of the Terrans' value as a war race, but the devastating results of including them in the trials, they were instead played to maintain their own peace. Should a time ever come when an outside force threatened the galaxy, they would be called. That act became known as a Terran deterrent. All of this was instigated by a legat that had somehow matured into a minor queen halfway through her life cycle. She had, with an unwavering commitment, gone so far as to instigate a mutiny on a small trial conflict fleet and took it to the heart of her own empire to demand an audience with her own queen of queens. The Legat had offered its own head as a condition her queen experienced the story of a Terran named Moldy. The queen declined her head after being witness to the rage of Moldy. She instead petitioned the Galactic Council for the expulsion of the Terrans and their immediate designation as a unique race. An amendment to the war trial system ensured that the Terrans would be well compensated to find other ambitions. They slowly spread out from their dying world and happily settled planets deemed inhospitable to the rest of the races. In time, the Terrans would become valued members of the Council, skilled diplomats, traders, artists, and healers. But they would never again play in the war games the rest of the races dabbled in. In principle, they would only intervene in the event of an external war or internal civil war, but this has never come to pass. End of story. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. There are links down below both to support this channel and for the author of this fiction. Anyways, I hope you all have a fantastic one, and I'll see you next time. Cheers. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. There are links down below both to support this channel and for the author of this fiction. Anyways, I hope you all have a fantastic one, and I'll see you next time. Cheers. Just a quick shout out to the T5 peeps. Bob the Dragon, Cat Crab Lobster, Data Magnet, Dark Machine, Mezic, Try Again 95, Feudic Yol, Astrea the Dreamer, Caspar Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Athelia, Meridian 117, and Jordan Buxmorm. Thank you very much.